See, his first reason is they slipped into inactivity, right? Nobody's, nobody says, well, I, I didn't go for a couple weeks, and now I think it's all bullshit. <laughs> Hey, what's up guys? It's X Morgan here. I have my husband Jared helping me out again today. Thank you very much. Today we're gonna to be talking about a blog post that is labeled the four reasons people leave the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and how to help them come back. The four reasons. The only four. <laughs> so this uh, blog post comes from the blog Go Go Gof. Go go goff. Go go goff. Go go goof. Or is it like go go Jeff? And it's just mm. spelled weird. If he s- incorrectly spells it the way that like Australians spell it, <laughs> Jeff. But All right. Well. Supposed to be an e. Geoff. Geoff. Uh. <laughs> anyway, just as a disclaimer, please don't go to this blog post and be mean to this guy. He seems like a very nice, upstanding. Mormon gentlemen, so don't be rude. When it comes to people leaving the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, oh, I just get winded every time. (sighs) Mostly because I'm out of shape, though, so. It is often for one of the four main reasons. I want to address the four main reasons as well as give advice on what you can do to help them come back home. Watch out, guys. You might be reconverted from this video. If you are, we still respect you. First, they slip into inactivity. The first and main reason people leave the church is because they simply slip into inactivity because of inconvenience. They fall out of the habit of gospel living. Scripture study, then morning and evening prayers are often the first thing to go. And then church attendance soon follows. Often this slip into inactivity is not a result of a major sin of commission, but rather a collection of sins of omission that they lose the companionship of the Holy Ghost and slowly dull their spiritual sensitivities till they justify sins of commission. (laughs) Then once sins of commission are committed, they feel ashamed that they have done wrong and Satan tells them a lie that they cannot go back and that repentance will not work for them. That's Uh, why our son left. Yeah. 14 months, he was just like, you know, he just kind of fell out of the habit. Luckily, he gives us advice for what to do. Oh, yeah, he's going to tell us what to do. But this, I I don't know, the first part is kind of... I wouldn't even call this people leaving the church. People who slip into inactivity. This is... That's a good point. That's just people who are... The four reasons people leave the church. Yeah, that's not leaving the church. That's like... Well, there needs to be this sort of distinction made here between not attending quite as often or going inactive, you know, and sort of renouncing Mormonism because they're two different things. Because some of the reasons he goes into are people who leave Mormonism, become ex-Mormons. Some of them are just people who, eh, I'm... Busy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's almost like there's no distinction. It's like they're saying, oh, this is the main reason that people leave the church, but it's like maybe they're just actually inactive and haven't actually left they just don't go all the time well i knew a lot of those people on my mission that just didn't go all the time and you talk to them about it and they still believe in it right just like yeah i just got a lot going on i slipped out of the hat so they haven't left the church so that seems a little i don't know yeah but But maybe this can lead into some of the other reasons or something well he's trying to say that It'll lead you to doing other sins, which, I mean, I guess, yeah. Sins of commission. (laughs) I guess, yeah, if you're not going to, if you're not spending, like, 12 hours of church-related time every week like most Mormons do, listening to people tell you not to drink coffee, maybe you'll start drinking coffee if you're not hearing that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, helping those people who have slipped come back. This group is the easiest to rescue. I love the word rescue in this. But it makes sense that they're using it, you know, because your soul is in jeopardy. As they feel the void in their lives, but they just don't know how to come back. Maybe they forgot where the church building was. Just kidding. That's not what I said. (laughs) Often they only need a welcoming friend to invite them to come back. But when they arrive, they need to be welcomed with loving arms and non-judgmental ward members. But didn't make sense there, buddy. That's okay. I mean, yeah. True. 
You keep looking at the screen while you're talking to the I'm camera. I'm going to put it up there when it's... Yeah, but not when you're talking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. you're making commentary, you keep looking Fuck, at the Fuck, is it your channel or is it my channel? I'm just saying, you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, my lover. No, thank you, though. They need a friend to guide them, sit next to them, and minister to them. If the church feels like home, they won't want to leave again. Bottom he's really, he's not wrong here. Yeah. This is for people who are... Who well, believe in it, but are inactive. This is good advice. People who are less advice. active, if you just go yeah, if talk they, to if them. If they and, feel good there, then they'll want to be there more often. It's pretty easy to get in to go to church again for at least a couple more months. <laughs> till they slip into inactivity again. <laughs> Assuming they haven't committed any sins of commission yet. Ooh. Help them secure their lives and family within the gospel with callings and fellowship. This group does not go less active when they feel wanted and needed within the church. True beans, I guess. True beans? Shut up. <laughs> I gotta start, you know, like, patenting my own sayings so that I can, like, you know, sell t-shirts to my empire of fans. <laughs> True beans! <laughs> Have a little cartoony coffee bean, I guess. <laughs> People would be into that. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, then he put this quote. Yeah, uh, no one cares. Okay, I'll read the second one. You can read the third and fourth. Okay. Second, the number two reason. <sighs> That people leave the church, they take offense. I know so many of you who watch my videos left because you were offended. All right, this is for you. The reason number two, they take offense. The second main reason people go less active is that they take offense. Now everyone is going to be mistreated at some point by a member of the church. Sometimes it is because we are human and make mistakes. Sometimes it is because that person is just not acting Christ-like. Either way, offense will come, but the choice to take offense and be offended is ours. <gasps> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> On my mission, a bishop suggests <laughs> that the mother... <laughs> On my mission, a bishop suggested that the mother of an overweight girl start doing something to help her. She took so much offense at this comment that she refused to go back, and the entire family went inactive. I could share dozens of stories, everything from innocent remarks that someone took offense at to stories where bishops committed crimes and sins, and they blamed the church. He's kind of basing this on, well, nothing. And... <laughs> So, I don't really know. I don't have numbers either, so I can't... I don't know how to refute it. Right. From the experience that I've had, it seems like most people who... Not people that go inactive, but people who sort of disavow the church. Most often, it seems history-related. Yeah. Probably, but I, again, that's totally in my head. I don't know if that's... Just from being in the community, that's what we've seen. I don't know if those are the real numbers. Right. Well, and someone who was, like, offended by a church leader probably wouldn't join, like, an ex-Mormon community no. and talk about it. So, mm -hmm. I guess we don't... Maybe we just don't run into those people. They're two different groups of people, and it's kind of doing his blog a disservice to not Mention distinguish that. that. It's a good point, really, because are, are these people really leaving the church, or are they just not going because they're upset? And again, I think this is really a minority group, because I remember growing up thinking that... The only reason people would leave the church is because they were offended. I also did get glimpses of people being upset about polygamy, but I was like, what? Like, why? Because I didn't know most of, you know, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know Joseph Smith was a polygamist, but anyway. Interesting. Two years ago, I had a member from my mission call me. The bishop had done something super offensive in their eyes. <laughs> in their eyes? Like, maybe it wasn't <laughs> just outwardly offensive all right i gave them my two-step formula to not taking offense Ooh, guys bonus nugget i told them no matter the reason for the offense understand these two things first the church is true despite the members replace with whoever has offended you what so if sister kathy has offended you he's saying insert her name there ah the church is true despite Kathy. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Second, don't escort anyone to hell. Oh. 
And the Book of Mormon doesn't tell you you are supposed to escort people to hell? Uh, you're thinking the river Styx. That's Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> the second part startled him. I explained that if someone is sinning and doing something wrong, there is no need for us to personally escort them with our families to hell to ensure they arrive there, I told him. <laughs> Let him go to hell. You need to worry about keeping your covenants. I, I get that. I get that. It <laughs> Mormons don't believe in hell, really, though. I mean, there's outer darkness, but, like, did the bishop do something that was outer darkness worthy? <laughs> I think he just said that because it rolls off the tongue quicker. It does, than, it does. Don't escort him to spirit prison and then later the <laughs> celestial kingdom. <laughs> I, most of the time when Mormons say hell, it's because it's easier than explaining all of the weird different places you go to. That's true. And, I mean, I get that. Like, he's saying, like, Okay, under the assumption that the church is true, you wouldn't want to leave just because someone was being a jerk. I get, I mean, I get that. I yeah. don't I don't think the church is true, so I don't agree, but... Okay, helping those who take offense to come back. So all of you who have been offended and left the church because of that, this is for you. This is, this is how we're going to bring you back. The way to overcome offense is simple. The ones who offended and is must be the one who offended... <laughs> <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Need to ask them for forgiveness to come home in humility and love, even if it was not intentionally given. Okay, wait. Can you translate that to English? <laughs> to competence? Um, yeah. <laughs> it. That was mean. Sorry, dude. You just had a lot of typos. Did you not read it again? <laughs> I'm not trying to dis... I'm not the best at grammar, but... It's... I'm not the best at grammar, but if I'm, I'm going to put stuff type out something <laughs> out for everyone to see, I'm going to look at it at least a second time. <laughs> or at, well, at least once. Yeah. <laughs> okay, to translate that. Uh, it looks like what he's saying, if you offend someone, even if you didn't mean to, you should apologize for it. Are you sure he wasn't saying... If you are the, he's saying if you the are the one, one who that, offended. Okay, yeah. so you're if your bishop offender, offended you, the bishop needs to go and apologize to you. Yeah. Okay. Which. What What if he doesn't know he offended you? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, you shouldn't apologize every time. Every time someone takes offense at something that you say, you gotta obviously, like the the example that he used is that bishop that helped Did the lady. Something. Yeah. They were told the lady to help her daughter who was overweight, right? Right, right. Now, there's different ways he could have gone about it. Like, if he... I mean, if he just went out and said, Yo, daughter, a fat ass, you need to help her lose weight. <laughs> and if he was like a dick about it, be like, Hey, sorry, I was a dick about it. Yeah. Um, but if he just said... Like, if he advised her at some point... I mean... Yeah, she's a little... She needs to lose some weight... You could help her in these different ways. She yeah. took offense to that. Eh. I mean, the thing is, yeah, he probably shouldn't be getting out of his business and into their business. But you got to realize that people are going to be nosy. People are going to say things. And, like, you don't have to make a big ordeal about it. But anyway. All right. I'm going to... Well, you didn't read the other part. Oh, no. When the person giving offense asks forgiveness and invites them to come home in sincerity and humility and not defensiveness, it invites the spirit of reconciliation needed to rescue to start. Needed... For the rescue to start. Needed for the rescue to start. That was my bad. I'm sorry, go, go, goaf. That was me. That wasn't you. The only thing preventing reconciliation is pride. Pride often on the part of the offender who feels justified. That bishop and his judgmental fat shaming. <laughs> <laughs> if your bishop fat shames you, uh, he should apologize. I guess that's the moral of the story. This might sound weird, but again, it's like my opinion here. There's no bad reason to leave the church. If you don't want to go, don't go. That's my opinion. But um, if you... You know, I do think that there's this weird, like, if you think it's a true church and you're choosing not to go because someone offended you and you're expecting that person to make recompense for it, I don't, I don't think that's taking real good responsibility because then you're saying like, oh, well, it's because of this person, like, I refuse to go or whatever. And again, I don't think there's a bad reason not to go necessarily, 
But I also think you should probably take responsibility for, like, your actions and your choices and stuff. I'm picturing people... I'm picturing the person who we're hypothetically talking about as having the, the I'd like to speak to your manager haircut, you know? <laughs> Karen. <laughs> it's like they're telling the bishop, well, you offended me. You just lost the customer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lady. I mean, I... I don't know. I That is a good point. I honestly think that the Mormons are right if someone pisses you off and if you think that you're gonna get your own planet but you're just you're like fuck it, I don't want a planet anymore. He called my daughter fat. <laughs> then that's stupid. Just tell him, hey, don't call my daughter fat anymore and then go get your own planet. <laughs> you do you guys. Reason number three. They take issue with church history. The third reason people leave the church is far less often than the other two. And it is because of church history. Again, the distinction here is missing. That people who go inactive, they're not necessarily leaving the church, right? Yeah. This is the actual first real reason, maybe, (laughs) that people legitimately actually leave, get their name removed kind of thing. Yeah. Perhaps. I mean, again, everyone's different, but in general. I just, I haven't heard a whole lot of people leave that, you know, I will say, I have heard of people who leave just because they, they're not feeling it, right? And they actually leave. They don't necessarily remove their name, but they actually leave. They don't believe in it, but they never look into church history. I have heard of that happening. Yeah, So it, happens, it does happen. But, but that's not, see, his first reason is they slipped into inactivity, right? Nobody's... Nobody says, well, I didn't go for a couple weeks, and now I think it's all bullshit. (laughs) History is not pretty. Church history is no exception. One of the most significant issues we make with history is the fallacy called presentism. What is presentism? Presentism. I think he said that too much. I think he made it up. He didn't make it up. It's a thing, but I think he learned it like that day or something because he keeps (laughs) saying it. (laughs) Presentism is when we look and judge the past based on our modern cultural understanding and expectations. Everyone in history can be twisted into a villain with presentism. That's a good kind point. Of, uh, yeah. It's kind of fair. I mean, like, some people could... Brigham s- Young wasn't that bad. Like, if he were alive today, like... <laughs> I'm just joking, guys. Some people could twist Gandhi into seeming like a bad person just because he slept naked with his great nieces, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just because it's inappropriate in this day and age Doesn't to, mean it's inappropriate to sleep then. naked with your great niece doesn't mean you can call Gandhi a bad guy. Yes, yes, of course. That said, I, I do think that... Your a- cultural uh, understanding and expectations are just different. That said, I do think that it's certainly true that when we look at history, we can look at look at it through the glasses of of our 21st century understanding. And so like you could call Abraham Lincoln a racist if you really look, like he said some things about black people, about like them, yeah, we were gonna free him but not make him equal or whatever, which right. which now would be considered very racist um, and but wrong. For, but for him, that was a huge jump in the right direction. Bill Maher said it really well once. He said they're, they're, ang- they're getting angry at us for not being yesterday who we are today or who we would eventually become you know like that said it i don't think that works with the church and that's because you know they they claim god's their front man right and i don't know why god would bend to cultural norms i don't know and not only bend to cultural norms but be wrong about things and kind of behind even other churches i don't think it necessarily applies to the church just because you know it's supposed to be led by God and if he's wrong like because now they disavow that practice they say that it was say what the practice was of denying black people the priesthood they mm-hmm. say that that was wrong right right um well if that means it was wrong then if it's if it was wrong then why didn't God say anything and if he did say something and the prophet just didn't listen he's like hmm, well cultural norms say that they're not people um then isn't he a bad guy? Right, right. When it comes to mistakes made by former leaders, a great quote comes from President Ballard. 
Too many people think church leaders and members should be perfect or nearly perfect. They forget that the Lord's grace is sufficient to accomplish his work through mortals. See, and, and this is where, like, the apologetics come in of, like, you guys are expecting them to be perfect. Like, what? I think it was in a video we watched with Quaker the other day. Oh, it's he probably was probably Brian like, Hales saying, Joseph was by no means a perfect man. <laughs> that sounds like Jordan Peterson. Yeah, I can't do Brian Hales. <laughs> you nailed Jordan Peterson, though. Um... <laughs> Anyway, uh, he said something to the effect of, like, well, of course prophets aren't perfect. Like, what's the point if we have perfect prophets? And I was like, well, first of all, I still think there'd be a point, but I don't expect them to be perfect. I don't even expect them to be close to perfect. I just expect them to be generally pretty good people. And maybe a little bit ahead of cultural norms. Maybe that's an unfair expectation, but... Or just decent, even for their time. Like, I mean, Joseph Smith was tarred and feathered based on an allegation that may or may not be true about sexual impropriety. And mm -hmm. if if some if a mob came after him because they thought he went after one of their sisters or, or something, yeah. that means it wasn't culturally acceptable at that time either. Like, if an entire <laughs> mob is attacking you for a thing, you've done a thing that's not culturally acceptable, whether it's mm -hmm. justified for them to attack you or not, which... Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Presentism. It yeah. was. It was. That was the time. Yeah, it, was, it was mobbing time. <laughs> yeah. It's clobbering time. I'm judging mobs through my 21st century glasses. Yes, just because they don't happen that often. <laughs> that just shows me that I'm not judging Joseph based on the standards that we have now or the standards that he had back then. That he, he was. People thought of him as a scoundrel. So. You know? Yeah. He wasn't with his times either. Yeah. And again, you know, to the defense of Joe Smith and the church, they're going to say, those are allegations and stuff, and we don't know the full truth, and, and we don't, but we know a lot, and it it does lead to some, Brian Hills calls it, head-scratching moments. And in fact, this this is a head-scratcher. That's a head-scratcher. That's a head-scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> Why did God threaten to kill Joseph if he didn't marry this 14-year-old? Well, and that one's just a head-scratcher, you know? <laughs> Helping those who take issue with church history come back. With the first two reasons, it is generally easier to rescue someone, as they still believe the doctrine. See, so there he kind of makes that distinction. Finally. I feel like these needed to be different essays. Yeah, like, because it really is inactive versus, like, apostate or whatever. Whatever you want to call it. Anti. Anti. Evil. Sexy. <laughs> but the final two sections are the most dangerous. Dangerous! Oh, I love it. I love being referred to as dangerous. I know. When someone takes issue with church history or doctrine, either they have often been antied. Been antied. What? Y'all have been anti- What does that even mean? Nice. Like, you've just been presented anti-information? No, you've been converted. It's, it sounds like he's just he's just turning anti into a verb. You've been converted into x Anti-ism. <laughs> Are you sure it's not often they have been anti like they've been given anti-information? Let's ask him. We'll call him later. Uh, well, it's not- <laughs> Probably not in the dictionary. But if I anti-you in- using context clues that he <laughs> said. That's me turning you against the church, probably. Right, right, okay. Someone write up a definition for what being anti means in the comment section, please. When someone takes issue with church history or doctrine, either they often have been anti and they reject witness and testimonies they already have had and start to demand a sign. Have you ever demanded a sign? I mean, like, when I started reading into church history stuff, you know, I, I, I just, I had serious doubts because I, I couldn't feel like I could trust certain doctrinal issues that I didn't agree with. I was just like, I, I just don't see why it is God would care about these certain particular issues. So as I started reading church history and stuff, I remember praying, like, God, like, I thought this church was true. Like, can you please tell me, like, what's going on? So, I, I mean, if that's asking for a sign, but that's what they tell you to do the whole time. I think I just stood up on a roof and said, strike me down. <laughs> I think maybe his 
sample for people who reject the church is like two. <laughs> I, I think it's Cora Horror. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's choosing because he's the wasn't that his thing basking for a sign. If God's real, yeah, give me a sign, and then he actually did get a sign. He got a sign. He yeah. got a sign. If they are no longer willing to walk by faith, all you can do is love them. There was an either, but there wasn't an or. Yeah, I know. I he know. just said they've either been A. <laughs> I like that he mentioned, like, all you can do is love them. Like, I think that's actually very good advice to Mormons, because I think they have a hard time understanding how to love their family members <laughs> that go inactive. Um, not everyone, again, just generalizations here from some stories. They are no longer willing to walk by faith. Now, I don't think that's necessarily true, um, because I think there's a lot of Mormon Mormons that leave Mormonity and go be Christian or Buddhist or whatever, and that, that's still walking by faith. It's just it's not walking by their faith, which is a no-no. For show show. Oh, show. Sure. Hey, that's another Morgan no no fo show show. <laughs> if they are still honest with their concerns, then the best quote I ever heard about church history issues actually came from someone who had left the church for doctrinal issues, which I will address in the next section. I will call him Jason, not his real name. <laughs> that's sweet. Good clarification. The discussion I was having with four people, myself, a fully active and believing member, Two RMs who had taken tons of issue with history, and Jason, who had left the church right before he was going to serve a mission. The two other RMs were complaining about history when Jason called them out and said, if the doctrine is true, then the history does not matter. I would say, on the one hand, I, I admire that a little bit, because it's like, oh, if, you, if the gospel is true, like, going to heaven, getting your own God planets, all that, then you shouldn't get tripped up by the little things, I think. The the problem is that history kind of presents to you that it's not true from the perspective of some people. And when that happens, then you're like, huh. it's like a... Are you saying a paradox? Yeah, it's like a paradox. History doesn't matter unless history teaches you that the church is not true. <laughs> yeah, well, so a good example is the first vision, right? <laughs> You can't really say, well, if using that specific piece of history, well, if the first, if the doctrine is true, then it doesn't matter if the first version didn't happen. It's like, well, if the first version didn't happen, the doctrine can't be true. Mm. Because that's where it came from. If, when you find out all the different accounts and how much they vary in, in the first vision, and apologists love saying, like, well, you never tell the story the same way twice. Yeah, well, I would if fucking God and Jesus came and talked to me. I'm not going to forget any of that. In the church's defense. Okay, okay. Put your apologist hat on. I want to hear this. In the church's defense. People will say, like, oh, he was presenting to different audiences, so he wanted to, you know, like... Keep, I can't, I can't Depending do Depending on who you're talking to, sometimes you lie to them about... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to help the Mormons, and I'm just making it worse by laughing. I'm sorry. I'm just... I don't want to be a jerk. I just... This is just where we're at. Okay, I'm sorry. When, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> they were taken aback by his comments. But they then retorted, but what about blacks and the priesthood? Or the changes with the word of wisdom? Or polygamy? They apparently didn't ask that. They exclaimed it. <laughs> Stop with the grammar correcting. To which Jason very firmly replied, if the plan of salvation is true, then those issues don't matter. And if the plan of salvation is not true, then those issues still don't matter. What? I mean... I understood the first part. Like, if the plan of salvation is true, then... Who cares about racism? <laughs> but what about the second part? Were you saying if the plan of salvation is not true, it still doesn't matter? Doesn't it matter? It should matter either way. But shouldn't it matter more if the truth is not true? I'm not really sure the point he was... I think, <laughs> I think he really thought this point was self-evident. 
But you really got to do some digging to kind of, like, some digging in your head, really, to, to try and think about what he's saying. Because, I don't know, maybe maybe it's sort of that, like, the Jehovah's Witnesses Church, right? I'm not part of it, never have been. If their history is murky, that doesn't really matter. If their church is untrue, right? Right. And I know it's untrue, then their history doesn't really matter to me. Because it will neither prove it positive or negative. I don't know. Okay. I'm trying to say what he... We're just going to have to call him. We'll call Goff. Go, go, go. It makes me think of Arrested Development when everyone calls him Gob. (laughs) Job. Fourth, they take issue with doctrine. Taking issue with the doctrine is the fourth main reason people leave the church. This group, like the third, is far smaller than the first two. But often, they are more vocal and want you to think they are a majority. See, we just want you guys to think that we're all leaving because we don't think the doctrine is true. But really, most of us just slipped into inactivity. (laughs) And y'all haven't come back bringing us enough brownies. I mean, see, he might be technically right in what he's trying to say, that people who were baptized Mormon, most of them that don't go now, are probably just not active or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, again, nobody's saying that. No, Nobody's saying that, oh, yeah, most people don't go to church. Mm-hmm. They don't mm-hmm. do so because they don't like the doctrine. They're saying most people who leave the church, most people who revoke it, don't like the doctrine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I remember on my mission going to an area that, like, I I opened the area book, and it has a list of all the members in that area. And there was 20, 25 active members in that branch. It was pretty small. Uh, But when I looked at the amount of members in that city, it was, like, it was over 800. What? Yeah. So, so yeah, there's, they don't, I mean, I would guess that a lot of those 800 people don't even, er, I would guess that a lot of those 800 people probably don't even remember that they're Mormon, really. Right, and you were in Brazil, and it's a yeah. more relaxed community kind of Yeah, they'll feel, just kind right? of get baptized on a whim, and they don't understand yeah. the commitment they're making. But Right, so it's so it would make sense that in those kind of circumstances, it's more likely that they're not really having any issue with the doctrine or history. They're just kind of like, eh, you know, life's happening, things yeah. are rolling on. Well, I wouldn't count those people as having left the church or ex-Mormon or anything like that. Yeah. Well, and you almost don't even want to count them as a Mormon in the first place, because if they got baptized on a whim, they they probably didn't really ever feel real committed, perhaps, but to each their own. See, when people leave the church because of doctrine, they run into a problem. They know too much. The Guys, I figured out why our lives are so hard. It's not because of rejection from family members. It's not because of, like, you know, feeling like we were brainwashed or that information was hidden from us anything like that it's just because we know too much ignorance is bliss mother truckers i think maybe he's being a little sarcastic it's hard to tell because no he's not i've read the rest of it he's not i don't know it seems maybe sarcastic to me like they think they know too much you know (laughs) they think they're too smart and intellectual no okay okay, okay, it's too good it's too good they know and still believe too many restored doctrines to go to another church. <laughs> it gets better. Keep going. All right. <laughs> See, there are truths that are unique to the Restoration that they know to be true. For example, the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only Christian church that teaches that all men are literal children of God, the Godhead, eternal families, etc. 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 These unique truths often cause those who leave the church to be disenfranchised with other Christian churches who teach philosophies of man mingled with scripture. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) When someone knows they are a child of God and they go to another church that teaches that they are only children by adoption and that we are really spiritual orphans that Christ took pity on, it is hard to go to that church. Because of this, Often, those who leave the church because of doctrinal issues take one of two courses. I get where he's coming from with this. I definitely understand it because it's like, 
they know too much. Like their spirit has partaken of the fruit. And so like nothing else can compensate in such an amazing way. So he's saying the problem is they know too much of- Of the doctrine. They know too much of the doc- of Mormon doctrine. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, isn't that so funny? It's yeah. not they know too much history. I okay. thought that's where he was gonna take it to, and it's not. Because, you know, according to him, it'd probably be there's, you can't know too much history, because if the church is true, it doesn't matter. History doesn't matter. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I get where he's going with this. It's like the church has given them the real truth and that their spirit can't like go to another church and accept that. And I get it because I, I'm not going to lie. Like I, I loved the doctrine of the atonement taught through the LDS church is very unique. I love the idea of God and Jesus and the Holy Ghost being three different guys. I thought that was awesome. Um, so yeah, it is, you know, it's like, I like anyone. I mean, when you're used to a certain belief system, it's hard to go to another one. But really, I think the biggest reason why it's hard to remain Christian after leaving the Mormon church for some people is because you just feel like you got burned so bad. Like you feel like you had all the answers and then you realize that they weren't true. And then you're like, how can I trust anything ever again? I, I think there's, I think that's part of it. But another part is that Mormonism does, they, they do this sort of good job at allowing their members to, to logically deconstruct all other forms of Christianity, they will mm -hmm. they'll use that logic. It doesn't make sense that God would be talking to himself when he was getting baptized. I mean, yeah, I remember I I knew all about the Nicene Creed when I was mm -hmm. in church, and mm -hmm. and how that's kind of a like they decided that the Godhead was a Trinity just because that's what everyone agreed to eventually. <laughs> so I th there's a lot of logic that they can used to deconstruct Christ other forms of Christianity, they won't turn it back on themselves. Right. But once, you know, once you're willing to turn that logic back on yourself... You're willing you've to already, turn it on everyone. Yeah, a lot of times you've already deconstructed a lot of other faiths. In the process. So there's no... That's a good point. Yeah. So after leaving, or after being anti <laughs> option number one. Go non-religious. Realizing that all other churches just lack the fulfillment, they just forego the church aspect of life. That's writing. Come on, Goff. The longer this continues, the more uh, the more the doctrines they forget. And the more doctrines they forget, the more likely they are to finally go to another church. <laughs> Why wasn't that going non-religious? And then he said, then they just go to another church? Yeah, no. So he's saying, like, they, they go non-religious for a temporary time, and then they start going back to church once they've forgot about the truth enough that their soul can handle a lesser truth. Mm. And then the other option is going to be they become anti. But, um, again, he's not really making room for, like, several other options. Obviously, some people just are atheist or agnostic, Buddhist, That's probably whatever, what he means you know, by anti. <laughs> I mean, I, I get where he would he might be right in, in a certain way with this because I don't see myself ever joining a church again, and especially because this, this hurt is very fresh. But, you know, I understand that some people, you know, once that hurt settles, they're ready to kind of go back to another church. Now, I don't think that's the case for everybody, um, but I imagine that you wouldn't want to just jump from one to another. In a lot of cases, you need that, like, settle time before you go to another church and his assumption there would be that, well, the reason why is because you're, again, it's the lesser fruit and you can't, you know, you have to stay away from the really good fruit for a while and then the lesser fruit tastes really good. The second course is they become antagonists. Anti. You know what antagonist means, Goff? Come on. <laughs> Give me some credit. <laughs> so make sure. Hello? Do you want to play Minecraft tonight? Fuck yeah. She says no, but I will. What? <gasps> The second option, other than going non-religious, that members take is apostasy. When they cut out the aspects of their life that are connected with the church, they feel guilt <laughs> as they know the truth and are not living it. These members take the truth to be hard, and the only peace they find is by attacking the truth 24-7, trying to convince themselves that their conscience is wrong and that they are not sinning. Mormons will never understand like how condescending that is like to people who leave the church for generally very sincere reasons. And especially because so many people who leave the church, it's not that they just wanted to be jerks or whatever. It's like they felt like they couldn't stay. Like I wanted the church to be true. 
I really did. But I just, I felt like I couldn't stay when I, when I came to my own conclusion that I just couldn't believe it was true anymore. And when you can't believe it's true, then you have a hard time staying there because you feel uncomfortable, you feel frustrated, and you feel like hurt all the time. So anyway, so it just, it's condescending coming from the other perspective when you're like, oh, they just, they know the truth. And that's why they feel so guilty all the time. And that's why they have to be all anti. And it's like, they don't realize that like, in our mind, we're not being anti as much as we're being pro-truth. Because when we find out that we think the church isn't true, then we feel like other people should know that. <laughs> and again, you know, we don't try to be jerks to Mormons. Like, I want to respect everyone to believe what they want to believe. But I still really want to help support those and let people know that they're not bad people because they don't believe in this church. And that's, you know, that's more of the goal of this channel, I suppose. But I was under the impression that our goal was to be anti. I feel like we need to have a talk after this, after this. About the direction that this is taking. <laughs> they become antagonists or anti Mormons. They can't simply leave it alone, for they know it is true. <laughs> In the words of Elder Glenn L. Pace. Now no. some of you may have heard this before. I'm not sure it's <laughs> Not used very often, but uh, you can leave the church, but you can't leave it alone. <laughs> they know that it's true. That is an assumption that you're getting from a Mormon who believes he knows it's true and believes that everyone knows that it's true as well. So. Well, I know that it's true. I just drink a lot so that I <laughs> can... Settle my conscience, you know. You do drink a lot. A lot. Like three times a month. <laughs> but I can you know. say a day. Nah, <laughs> I didn't want to tell them the truth. That would be <laughs> bad. <laughs> Helping those who take issue with the church doctrine come back. Helping those who take issue with the church doctrine come back is by far the hardest task that we will face in our call to rescue the lost sheep. Because of the two courses they take, the path to rescue is different. Those who take the course of going non-religious are often still intellectually honest. Which, do you see that assumption there? So that's assuming that people who are anti are not intellectually honest. Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. With this group, I have personally found that often their issues are less with doctrine and more with culture. I have a lot of issues with culture, definitely. I also have a lot of issues with doctrine, so... Well, if you have a string of principles that is only practiced by a shitty culture, which I don't really think Mormon culture is that shitty, but M Mormons who are defending the church tend to try to kind of paint it out like, oh, it's just the culture. It's just the culture that's terrible. Right, and it's and like, like, if like, it's if, a true church, why would it be such a terrible culture? Yeah, if you... If, what breeds a terrible culture? Terrible ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and again, more not all Mormon culture is bad. Like, wh what we're specifically talking about is the shame and kind of just really, judgment. It's bad for some people. It's, <laughs> it just, it's very so much from word to word and everything. Like, But um, I will say that there are some good things from the culture. You know, hardworking kind of ethics, you know, um, brownie making. Spot on. And then there's bad things like putting carrots in jello. <laughs> Don't blame the moments for that. <laughs> That's their fault. <laughs> Simply separating the two causes them to start soul searching. That is what happened with my friend Jason. By the end of our discussion with my two RM buddies, he thanked me and told me he had a lot to think about. That's a nice way of saying, okay, let's stop talking now. <laughs> For those who have gone down the path of becoming antagonists to the church, your options are very limited. Love them, pray for them, but don't waste time arguing with them or trying to convince them. Not bad advice. Actually good advice. Yeah. Good advice both ways. Don't don't try to shove onto people that they need to believe the church is false, and people who believe it's true don't shove onto people that they need to believe that's true. It's not going to be good either way. Until they are willing to swallow pride and accept witnesses... <laughs> This guy is telling us about swallowing our pride. They know it's true. Just to quote this guy. <laughs> Until they are willing to swallow pride and accept witnesses from the spirit, rather than signs, they won't change their ways. Simple. 
Stand firm in love and truth. And remember the words of Elder Joseph P. Worthlin. To those who have strayed because of doctrinal concerns, we cannot apologize for the truth. We cannot deny doctrine given to us by the Lord himself. On this principle, we cannot compromise. I just, I think it's funny that, you know, he's blaming it on pride. Although, I I mean, there's pride on both sides of this. That You know, people have pride in general. It's not necessarily just Mormons or just ex-Mormons. The whole, like... And they walk on faith instead of wanting a sign. It's just, it's one of those things where it's like, I think, I don't know, in my case, it's like I got to a point where I was like, I didn't need a sign. I didn't want a sign. I just was like, oh, this is, this is what feels right to me. And this is also what makes sense to me. And that's just kind of, you know, I mean, but, but Jared, he's still waiting for a sign. He Waiting for that sign. Stands up on the roof every night like... Swear to gosh, I'll come back. (laughs) Holy frack. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I think the list is kind of incomplete, obviously. Um, I think, honestly, reason number one should be that we wanted to sin. (laughs) Uh, That's why I left. I wanted to sin. Mostly, like, wanted to sing songs that had swear words was probably like one of my favorite he also didn't say anything about how we never had a testimony yeah he yeah very incomplete um (laughs) uh yeah no because his whole point was that they know that it was true all along it's funny because the is it's one of two things it's either they they know it's true and that's why they're guilty and they're anti they they feel guilty and they're anti or they never really had a testimony and that's why they were able to fall away because they never really had a testimony. So, you know, it's one of those. But, I mean, he did a good job. He had some good advice. I do think that there is a lack of distinction between, you know, being inactive versus actually leaving the church. Um, but, I mean, these these generally cover the, the issue. I mean, when it comes down to the issues of why people leave, it's either doctrine or history, mostly. Um, that doctrine's pretty all-encompassing. Reason number five that people leave the church, they wanted to do butt stuff. Ew. Thank you guys so much for watching this video today. Just a reminder that me and my business partner, Angie, who teach uh, life classes to people, are going to be teaching a class this week on Wednesday about how people pleasing shows up in your parenting. It's a free class. If you'd like more information, that will be in the description below. I also just want to give a shout out to everyone who has supported me these last couple weeks have been really hard for me and really hard for Jared because of all the crying I've been doing. So many of you have reached out to me in love and consideration, and it's helped me so much during this difficult time. I really, really appreciate all the support. So drop some comments below about which of these awesome reasons you left the church, and don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you guys in the next video.